Welcome back to another Jazz Basketball Breakdown. Just got done watching Jazz versus Nets. We obviously missed you guys. Jazz Hornets. Dealing with a couple things. Sean was having technical difficulties <laughs> trying to get the video uploaded. and I did it perfect. I uh, broke. I was not there. Unfortunately, I had a death on my wife's side of the family. So, a couple reasons we were kind of out Saturday. Or was it Saturday? Yeah, but... That game looked a lot funner than this game. I didn't get a chance to watch that game. I wish I, I would have had to miss this game. <laughs> that game had an incredible first half, no question. Very efficient first quarter. Um, we kind of squeaked it out down the stretch. wasn't very impressive, but a lot more fun than this one. <clears throat> and I don't know, the screaming by the Brooklyn Nets <sighs> woman near the freaking camera. <laughs> The entire second half. Oh, oh my, my gosh. gosh. I hate when that happens. Muzzle that chica. Holy cow. But, yeah, this was, I mean, they just start to finish wasn't really ever close. Yep, they, there was a little stretch. Start of the second half where our starters kind of got into it and, and brought it back within 10. Um, but overall, uh, physically outmatched us. Um, and they were shooting well, right? They just looked comfortable on their shot, right? We weren't right. contesting well enough on the outside. Um, and outside of our center position, I think we were kind of out physical, but yes, our two fives, I thought, competed well. Yeah, John John Collins was a beast tonight, over and over again, made just some incredible plays. Absolutely taking it to Claxton who has been a menace for the Jazz in the past. Right. Even though Claxton, on, on a couple of gimme dunks that he got, thought that he was going to scream in our ear and jump around and, and bless his little heart. Um, that was just weird. Yeah. Uh, other than that, I mean, John Collins really pushed him around and had his way with him several times. A bunch of times got rebounds. I mean, it was impressive outing by Collins without really a whole ton of usage. I thought he was strong. Walker Kessler came in with a ton of energy as well. Yeah, right came see. in and, and Ben Simmons was he, – he did what you're supposed to do. If you're going to play Ben Simmons as a five, you need to make him punish. You need to make him pay on the boards. Mm -hmm. And even though Ben Simmons can be a good rebounder, it he shouldn't ever be able to beat Kessler on the boards. And Kessler showed that. he There were several times where he was just like tipping it around Ben Simmons and using his length and athleticism. And so, that yeah, I was super impressed with both Collins and Kessler tonight. They looked very good. Um, one thing that I think stood out really for the Nets, and, and we've talked about this about our team, is priding ourselves on our defensive versatility. Um, well, the Nets have two of the most defensively versatile and talented defenders in the league. Right. With Cam Johnson, Mikel Bridges, and they really flexed tonight in a lot of ways. I mean, Sexton, the handful of times he tried to explode by him and oh get in there gosh. in the paint, and they played him very nicely, made it very difficult for him. Um, you could tell that he got frustrated as he wasn't being able to get right. you know, the, the typical points in the paint and, and stuff like that wasn't falling. Um, but they, they played him nice. Cam Johnson had a really nice game. Mikel Bridges had a more of an offensive game, but both of them together, man. That they, are the, they are the upgraded version of, of what we enjoy about like Fontecchio and you know, Chai Agbaji. Those guys are, right. are the next level. It was fun to watch that. Yeah, and... Speaking of Colin Sexton, he struggled tonight. And it wasn't just like, yeah, he had seven assists, and they kept just raving about that throughout the game. And it's like, how many freaking times, though, if it, of his one for ten, was it just just head down until right he yeah. gets there and then finally throws up a shot over Cam Johnson, who's got eight inches on him, yeah, you know, nine inches on him, and just awful possessions, awful shots. No one else is in a rhythm, and so it's like, yeah, he had seven assists. It just doesn't matter when that's the type of game you're playing. And, and to be honest, the last game, he had an incredible first quarter, like getting everything he wanted, driving to the hoop, hitting shots, dishes. I mean, he was doing everything. Started the second quarter and on, he started to get into a little bit of a head-down mode as well in that game. Second half was not good. Still had a whole bunch of assists. His stats for the game were good, yeah. right? People look at it, oh, my goodness, what a game. If you watch it, it really was about a quarter and a half of good ball, and, and the rest of it started showing signs kind of like it was tonight. Yeah. Uh, it's, so hopefully this isn't something that's a big spell he's going to be on because he's had an incredible run last month, month plus. 
So, but if, if you watch the Charlotte game as well, it wasn't that great second quarter on. Right. And I just, I don't know. He, some of the lineup choices tonight was puzzling, you know, of, of playing certain players when they weren't playing well or were playing well. And, and that's kind of one of those moments like second half or second quarter, we, we bring him back in. We, we pull Clarkson and we bring him back in next to Keontae George and it just, it just was not good. It, I, it, it, it was puzzling to me why we didn't bring in Chris Dunn. Chris, Chris Dunn, he had a couple silly turnovers tonight, but defensively was playing very well, um, was shooting the ball really well. And, and, and so it felt like that was the guy you reward in those minutes down the stretch of the second quarter instead of Colin Sexton, who just was not playing a good game, was yeah. was hurting us on the court. Yeah, and one thing that's been, I think we've seen enough information to call it a trend, our second unit has been poor Yeah, for I, a while now. I mean, we have to play straight zone. And that's the thing. The is, entire time we have that group is in. Is technically our bench unit outscored their, their bench unit. A little bit of skewed numbers there, right? And and because our no one on our bench was lighting up until Keontae kind of went off in the fourth when it just didn't matter, but at least he kind of went off a little bit. But no one really had a huge scoring outburst from our bench. It just and like you said, if we're not going crazy scoring with our bench, our bench gets torn it's, to shreds because because Keontae Clarkson and Olenek all together on the court defensively are a nightmare. It's rough, and, and I mean, they left their starters in until the, what, two-and-a-half-minute mark or something like that? Right. So it's it comes down to minutes played on that as well. Um, yeah, I, it's been a number of games that that we've – that our second unit it feels like we've been we've been losing ground. We have to play straight zone with them in. Um, there we, we've lost some of the efficiency. Olenek seems to be in a real slump, a real Dude, downer. Hey, there's just so many times lately of – just garbage, lazy basketball from Kelly Olynyk. Like his turnover, he had. He gets a rebound, kind of fights off a guy for a rebound, takes two dribbles, and then just like ooh behind the bag, not really paying attention. The guy just comes and grabs it from him. It's like, did you just forget that there was a guy right next to you? Like it just he just seems he really seems uninterested right now. Seems to be in a bit of a slump. I mean, it's it's the rough days in January of the season, but it seems to be extra rough for him. Perhaps, perhaps I have I have an idea. Every time that he passes, he can try and do a fancy pantsy move. Oh my gosh! Like Ben Simmons. <laughs> ben Simmons. I don't think he hold made on. a simple. Are you open right there? Nope. Hold on. Yeah, I don't think he ever made a simple. Just like <laughs> even when he was passing it and said behind the back, even when he was passing there, he was like. <laughs> like cool dude like awesome why don't you go pass up another wide open layup <laughs> shoot it man oh wait yeah that was that was kind of funny we were laughing about that during the game so maybe maybe that'll help be a little pick me up for kelly olin yeah kelly olin really struggled tonight and it it does make you wonder if part of kind of the stretch that we've had of olinic is because there's a lot of talk of is he gonna be here in a week that's tough. There's no question. It would be tough on anybody going through that situation. You know, you say they make millions of dollars. That's why they're in that situation. Sure. But it still is rough on the player, the wife, the, the kids. It's stressful, right? Because you, you're, you're yeah. concerned of where am I going to be going, blah, 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 blah. But at the same time, it's hard if you're knowing that to, to want to put your heart on the court for that team. If, if it's pretty sure that you're going to be gone in a week. No question. Or two weeks, three, right? It, it, I get it, but but still, it's it has not been helping us. To, he did not help us on the court at all tonight. It's been, it's been a bit of a, a slump for him. Um, and, and without having kind of the, a, an excellent offensive output from that group, which is what it's supposed to be, right? The Keontae, Jordan Clarkson, Kelly Olenek, and then a couple of defenders with him. Yeah. If we don't get that excellent offensive output, it's... It's it's really tough for us to gain any ground when that second unit's in there. So, yeah, and then um, kind of switching gears a little bit to Lowry marketing. He went four for twelve, 
I believe, tonight. Um, scored two points in the second half. I think he scored four points outside of the first quarter. And and it's just... I, I'm at a point where I'm so sick and tired of hearing Holly Rowe or Roller Jack or whatever. People... People just being like, oh, well, you know, the, 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 this team is just, they're just making it really hard for them to give him the ball or just playing really physical with him and stuff like that. And, yeah, that is part of it. But how often are we just not getting him the ball or not getting him the ball in any sort of good position? Like, like, like I get it. He, he, he needs to be the star and be able to catch the ball up top and, 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 and do his own, his own work and create his own shots at times. But also at the same time, when they're freaking marking – Royce O'Neal, who's 6'4 at best against Lowry Markkinen, just put him in the paint, put John Collins in the opposite corner, spread the floor like that lineup is supposed to be able to do, and pass it to Markkinen. And let's maybe see if our freaking all-star can go one-on-one against a 6'4 wing. We saw it happen once in the third quarter. The other team brought a triple team. Yes. The ball swung around. Three point shot. We end up with a wide open shot after a couple passes that Markkinen started. Right, and that's what happened every time. Um, it's it's the Nets really. When we played the Nets earlier this season, we caught them at home. They were on a downer. They didn't look like themselves. We kicked the crap right. out of them. Last year, in, in the times before that we've played them, they played us really tough because they were an ultra physical switch everything at the point of the screen. You know, get up into you. And so a lot of times our our pin downs, our, our cross screens that we do, you know, for marketing and a lot of the plays, they really aren't as effective as some of the other teams we play. That's fine. But like you said, understand the matchups. Find them down there, go to them. Claxton looks like he looked like he was extra sensitive and soft today, no matter who he was on. Right. Go at him. I, I think marketing's physicality has gone up so much this year, he would handle any of them. Right. And then let them run the double team and the triple team at him. That, that would be what, what would happen. Well, and that's the thing, right? The whole point of why we're playing John Collins at the five is because we can have five out. Mm-hmm. So if we're not willing to then let marketing go down low and have the open space there without Collins being there, what the hell is the point? The, and, and that's the thing with how well Collins is shooting, how well Fontecchio is shooting, how well Sexton's shooting open threes. You let marketing catch the ball in that paint and you send the double. Hell, Chris Dunn's shooting th- Open set shot threes well. Yeah. And so you 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 kick it down to marketing. Wherever the double team comes from, it we will punish that team. Just let it happen. It's so frustrating. I'm I sure agree. a lot of our Finn audience is extremely frustrated by having to watch that. It's it's uh sometimes we we kind of I'm not sure. Well, I don't know how to say this. I'm not sure what, what the exact game plan was, but it's sometimes we just run ourselves out of what the simple solution is. Yeah. It, it's, and you kind of mentioned it during the game too. We're really bad against switching teams because it's like, oh, well, this isn't working now. I'm just going to go one on one. It ends up being <laughs> a 90% isolation. And, and we're really not a great isolation team. We have a couple players who are good isolation players, but beyond that, it it's not any sort of recipe for success for the Jazz. Yeah. So it's, I mean, to, anytime we play a, an ultra switching physical get up into your team, we should be looking for the matchups because against a team like this tonight, we do have matchup advantages. Yes. Uh, especially at our four and five position where we start, right? Um, so that we that's what we. I would prefer that we would hunt in that situation and move the ball, you know, play the spacing game, which sometimes we really struggle with. Sexton seems seemed to like really struggle with his spacing night. He kept running to the ball all the way across the court. Um, better spacing, better understanding of matchups instead of trying the screen game when you have a team that's just going to switch every encounter. Yeah, it, it seems to be something we don't really work great off of. Because here's the thing, too, is if you really watch it, there's several times because of the way our pin downs happen and stuff, the way Mark will come and set a back screen and come through and then go to post up, there was a couple times he sets the back screen and Clarkson or Sexton or somebody, you know, one of our guards, they, they run behind him, they switch it. That guard then just kind of hangs out in the paint right there for a bit and then goes and gets the ball. If they just clear out with it, 
It is a wide open dunk for Lowry Markin every time because the guard, the, the, the switch happens and they follow the guard. If he just keeps rounding to the corner and you've got the ball in Keontae's hands or Chris Dunn's hands, it's a freaking wide open layup every single time for Lowry Markin. We didn't look for that one time, and there were several times when it was available. And, and one thing that I noticed that Brooklyn did, and to their credit, they did it well, is, is as our ball handler up top, and I saw it happen with Sexton, I saw it happen with Fontecchio, is they would pressure that ball handler big time, and instead of being able to handle that pressure and still scan the court with their eyes, we were turning our back. Right. And so we missed with some opportunities for that, um, and that's just, it, just good aggressive pressure on the ball. That's one of the keys to stopping easy entry passes and, and ideal windows for, for teammates making their cuts and stuff. Um, I was going to bring something up. I freaking blank just barely. I talk a lot, dude. Sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm sure I'll think it was super important. Yeah. It, it was just an overall frustrating game. And I don't know about you. I don't know about you guys. I, I am so sick of watching how many just – just lazy, uninterested, no zero effort, loose ball plays by Clarkson and Olenek. The, the, the amount of times that those guys will watch a ball just kind of right in front of them and they don't give any sort of effort for it or anything like that is just frustrating. Like, like Will Hardy talked about it. You know, he, he quoted, to, quote, quote from him tonight is, we are not as good as, as teams, uh, people have been saying we are the last month, and we're not as bad as we were the first month, which, sweet, that makes us about a 500 basketball team. And if that's the case, why are we still have either not traded these veterans who are not going to be here in a couple of years anyway, or started playing some of our young players more, um, playing playing the right matchups, playing Keontae with Chris Dunn, Keontae with Obaji at the two, and, and Markinen at the three, or... Taylor Hendricks some minutes when when he finally got a little bit of playing time defensively he was every bit as good as any wing on our team and the offense will come he's show he's a great three point shooter and then so I I don't know I, I I'm at a point where it's like I, I, give me the losses I just want to freaking see some development in some direction with the team. Yep. And, and that is what I was going to bring up was the Hardy quote. So good job, <laughs> good work. You talked yourself all the way back into what I was going to say. Um, and, and I agree with what he said, right? I, I agree. Yeah, I, I think we're burning, I we were burning brighter agree. there for a bit than, than what our real level we was. We talked and about it, that. Exactly. And, and at the start of the season, we were much worse than what our actual level was. Um, and so as we're figuring out what kind of a team we are, right, this, this comes around to that kind of discussion like you're bringing up and, and talking about there is what is the purpose of, of this season then and what are we trying to do, right? Right. Um, I think that, that, you know, with some luck and, and bounces of the ball that we could be a play-in team and have a, a possibility to maybe get a playoff series out of yeah. it. You know, which would be great experience. Um, I don't think that it's it's worth it's worth the squeeze. The juice isn't worth the squeeze of playing our veterans heavy, heavy minutes and having our youngsters sit down, as, which is the point you were making. Um, I would like to see much more Keontae with starter level players around him doesn't mean he has to start but i would like to see kind of a different sort of rotation and in subbing patterns where he comes in and has some time to play at the two you know or, or you know play at the one and have agbaji there with him or have chris dunn like you're saying and have markinen and john collins out there on the court too or markinen and, and a kessler I, I would like to see him get those kind of experiences in more spells during the game um you know maybe we'll see that after some moves of the before the trade deadline, which is we got like up. a week, week and a half, I think, for the trade deadline, which is coming up. I mean, it's I believe trade deadline is the eighth, um, so a week from Thursday. Yeah, so we'll see. And and I think that Danny Ainge and, and crew are going to wait till the very last second. It's what they do, right? Piss uh, me off for another week and a half. <laughs> I mean, last time I think that they got the deal done with an hour to spare, right? Um, yeah. So that's that's probably going to happen, but. It makes, makes you wonder and question, okay, what level of team are we really? And we've got some tough games coming up, man. Yeah. We've got some rough ones. Back-to-back uh, -back tomorrow going into New York. New York's been tough. They did just lose John Randall with a shoulder injury. Julius Randall? Him too. That's his cousin. Wow. 
John Randall plays football for the New York Knicks. Yeah, yeah. D lineman. <laughs> Don't act surprised. This always happens. So that's going to be a tough game going in there. Knicks have been playing well since they picked up Ananobi. Mm-hmm. Um, so that'll be an interesting one tomorrow. But we've got some tough games coming up where we could easily slip below 500, you know, out of kind of the playing level. Look ourselves in the mirror a little bit more and figure out what kind of team are we? What, what is our purpose right. these next three months? And that's the big thing is it, it, there's, there's no real chance of this team right now winning a championship. Everyone knows that. So why are we playing Clarkson 34 minutes a game? Why are we playing Olenek 30 minutes a game? It, it doesn't make sense because even if they aren't traded, in the next week and a half, they're both not going to be here when this team is ready to run a championship run. And so that's fine. They're good players and they're on the team. They should be playing minutes, but they should not be playing heavy minutes. Um, allow us to kind of, you know, allow to tinker with those minutes to play some of the young guys and and really start the development process. I understand playing John Collins heavy minutes because him and marketing need to have really good chemistry together. If they're going to continue that, that's why Keontae needs to play with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and same thing with Kessler and, and Markkinen, and maybe even I would like to see sometimes running a Kessler Collins Markkinen lineup and, and go to that at times. You know, to to start working on things and, and working to see if it's ever going to work. If it's never going to work, then at the end of the day, the worst case scenario is we have a pretty damn good one-two punch starting center, backup center, mm-hmm. but. Yeah, I, I, I'm ready to see Taylor Hendricks. I'm ready to see him with good minutes with good players. That, that's the next step that has to happen. Um, has to, in my mind, at least. There are many Jazz fans that want to try and win whatever games they can, and those are kind of the different opinions out there. But that was, I, I seriously had someone at work seriously say that. They were like, why not just, just ride it out and get as many, many wins as we can this year, and if we get a playoff run, it'd be fun. And I'm like, I don't give a shit about it being fun. I want to, I want to build a team that's trying to win a championship. That that is so much of just a loser mentality, of of let's just let's just try to go play one playoff series and have some fun. Give it a good old college try. Yeah, you it, know where and, literally every every NBA front office calls that NBA purgatory. Yeah, and so it's like, no, we don't we don't want to be there. I would rather miss the playoffs altogether this year. Play develop players in the right positions. Chris Dunn's timeline is a perfect backup point guard in a few years when we're ready to make that run and Keontae is maybe ready to take that step or whatever happens there. But worst case scenario, he's a perfect backup point guard to run your bench unit on a championship level team. And so at a league his, minimum, <laughs> his minutes, his, his minutes actually don't make sense because he's barely playing. He he plays the start of the first quarter and the start of the third quarter and sometimes closes out the game. That's about it. He should be playing more minutes than he's playing. Realistically, I, I the the sub that happens in the second quarter should be Clarkson out at like the eight minute mark for Chris Dunn and let Chris Dunn and Keontae play together. And then you bring Sexton in with like five minutes left. Especially because he's a facilitator. Yes. And, and if he's going to be playing with those young guys, right? Yeah. He, um, not, he's not only a great is he playing fit well, next to them. He, he, he elevates every player around him that way. Yeah. So it's, it's great positive assistance for young players that need confidence, that need that for in, sure. their, in their journey. So I agree. That makes sense. Um, once again, we talked about guards pairing together, avoiding the Clarkson Sexton backcourt, avoiding the Clarkson, Keontae, Keontae George backcourt. Even even Keontae George and Sexton is a little bit rough. You know, even though sometimes they can make some plays and do some things. Overall, it it doesn't quite fit, which which makes you question some things about about what players, even though even if they're putting up good numbers, are a fit long term on our team. You know, right. and that's that, that's one of the questions I have about Sexton. I love that dude, and the things that he's doing are amazing. I just struggle long term. If we believe that Keontae George is our ball handler, our one out there, do we think that him and Sexton next to each other is a pairing that has championship basketball written over it? And I don't think it does. I don't either. Even though I think Sexton is an awesome player, he's doing some incredible things, the way that he's been been coming along this season. I just, and he's burning hot right now, has high trade value, has a team-friendly contract. All that stuff. It there is an argument, there is a conversation you can have out there of does it make sense to move him to 
to a team for somebody, maybe a piece that looks like it would fit a little bit more, at least on paper, right. to make a, a higher level run. That's, that's just one of those, this is how I think, right? You know, I'm always shooting yeah. ideas to you guys and I, trades and what ifs. Right now, I wouldn't strictly because Keontae still really is developing. We don't really know where he can be offensively, um, not just as facilitating, but as an overall offensive player. I still am in the mind that I think Colin Sexton is a great six man on this team. <laughs> There's just, he's just better than any of the really other twos on the team right now. Yeah. And I mean, he has turned it up and, since we've been starting him. The numbers have been crazy. And damn, what, what a great fit that would be if we either play Agbaji or uh, bring in another two or, you know, off trade like Quentin Grimes have been discussed or whatever like that. To just flip flop and put Keontae, you know, if if you make that decision, but put Keontae in the starting lineup next to a two, and then Chris Dunn still is next to Colin Sexton, and is a really good fit next to Sexton. He is a good fit with Sexton on that bench unit, and that makes our guard bench unit freaking dangerous. The part that makes me question it is how high he's burning his market value. No, no, no I get it. I get it. I I, I understand. I understand. At this point of versus of if making he's really that a trade, thing, yeah. yeah, I know I to get me, that. You, you, can, you can make the argument. Doesn't mean that that argument's always if, right. If or the trade, it. yeah, if the trade, if there was like a trade for Colin Sexton right now, as long as we got the right pieces back, I wouldn't be upset at all. I love Colin Sexton, mm -hmm. but it, 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 like you said, this is probably the best his trade value will ever be in his career. Especially with so, that contract. So I understand the thinking. Like it makes sense, a hundred percent. I just. I also think he would be a great fit as a six man. I also think that Bryce Sensabaugh, if we give him the opportunities, could have that potential as well. And I'd be willing to give that a shot and make some trades. And, and if y'all had a chance to see the highlights from a couple nights ago against uh, the Lakers G League team, I can't remember what they're called. Something, something. Some, the, the, yeah. I'm not even gonna try it. <laughs> try it. Try it. We're, yeah, it's a pretty uh, nice we're place. Not get canceled tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's boring. Yeah, um, some good plays on there though. That was that was a heck of a game to close out as well. Um, that, that's that's a point too of of what lanes can we open up for the youngsters coming up. But um, most of you jazz fans would probably go out of your mind if I hung out with you because I'm always throwing these scenarios. Think about this. Think about this. What about I do. this? Don't worry. Be like in, in my my whole thing is you can make the argument. <laughs> it's like okay, you can, you can if you're an idiot, make but you the can. argument that you can go home. <laughs> you can make the argument that you shouldn't text me anymore. Yeah, probably go out of your mind though. But that's that's what I do. It's I don't know how I think. You got to be willing to have those conversations when you're trying to build a championship team, right? You you have to be open to everything. Like 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 hell, even being open to a marketing trade. I am. You just got to give me your entire team, <laughs> right? Right. It, all and of it, your comes entire down, future. All of it comes down to the right trade, right? And, and even Markin has said that. He said he believes he'll be in Utah. And he wants to be in Utah and everything like that. But at the end of the day, he understands what this is. He understands it's a business. And if the right trade comes along, now the Jazz have made it pretty adamant that the right trade for him is basically what we got for Rudy Gobert, and no one's going to offer that for Larry Markin, which is fine. I want him here, but yeah, yeah. No, we're on the same page there. So, I don't know. That, this, this is why we have a lot of fun with jazz talk, even in the off season. Yeah, hundred percent. I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to see what we do this year. But I'm excited for the off season. Some of the topics we can really dive into on this channel together. It's true. Um, on some of that stuff. So, so don't worry. When the off season comes, we're not going away. We will be pretty consistent with that as well. But overall, let us know what y'all think of kind of where your thoughts are of what you're hoping the next week, week and a half with trade deadline and then the rest of the season, what we do. Um, if not, we will see you guys tomorrow. Thanks, guys.